discussion of a lot of history, which a lot of our viewers who watch uh, have no history, uh, don't know the history of San Francisco. Just 20 years ago, it's a, it's a, our politics has been so rich, so invigorating. We produce such powerful people like Willie, Willie Brown and, and Feinstein and uh, Burtons and so on. You know, we have a tradition of creating this kind of leadership. We're a unique place, and yet I do not see the vibrancy of the past uh, control of the party, developing the farm team. It seems like we've lost that, and that's one of the reasons why there's, uh, there's no healthy debate in this city over the, the major issues. What's your take? You know the history. You know the Burtons. <laughs> well, you know, there's some benefits to a machine, you know? Uh, political machine. More recently here, a political machine. More recently here uh, in the city, there's a lot of criticism of Willie Brown. He was part of the Britain machine. Well, you know, I'll tell you something about Willie. He got things done. You know? He ran things his way, and uh, he ran City Hall. There's now, uh, Gavin has a much more different approach to City Hall. It's much more of a corporate structurized, you guys do all your things. Uh, not like, hey, come into my office. What the hell are you think you're doing over there? Right? Right. There isn't that sort of style. Our department heads who have never, ever had a meeting with the mayor. Yeah. His own department heads. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the rare things I've ever seen in a lecture time was this, this, this very unusual union of these civil service managers, you know, department heads and sub-department heads and that entire bureaucracy, which, by the way, somebody told me the other day that the city budget of San Francisco is just about even now with that of Chicago's. And Chicago has uh, close to, uh, you know, three times the number of citizens we have. Yeah. And uh, we have more city employees than Chicago. So you guys say, what's going on? Well, what's going on, I guess, is that uh, everybody's settled into their niches. And the way you get ahead is to go along. You got to run for the central committee. You got to run for the school board. You got to run for... Uh, the city college position. Now, hey, uh, no criticism anybody's ever run for the school board or the city college board, but was that their main aim in life, to be on the city college board or even the school board? I don't think so. It was a stepping stone to politics. And now that uh, politics are paying for supervisors anyway uh, a decent salary, uh, more people seem to want it, and to get it, yeah, you're going to have to go with some sort of a program that the uh, inner workings of City Hall. I mean, everybody's got a uh, interior government. You know, the English had it, uh, still have it. Uh, you know, whatever administration it's in, foreign policy, the workings, everything, just move right along. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize in San Francisco it's the, it's the same game. Uh, City Hall, if the mayor and all the supervisors went on a trip to Mars for a year tomorrow, <laughs> trust me, City Hall would keep on going the same way. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, and people know each other. Uh, it, it's, it's just a very slow-moving machine, very slow to change its ways, to sh allow itself to be shaken up. And if you go along with that... Um, you're, you're going to get along. So, stuff. well, one something you said in the last segment is is when you have a one-party system, a democratic party. This is what it's like. In other words, whether you're in in in, in China or elsewhere, this kind of frustration is what you feel when there's only one party, and, and the only conflict is within the party. Uh, you're saying that's a natural outcome of not having two solid, different points of view and two sets of c candidates, two sets, two parties then you have that healthy debate. And also you have flush uh, taxes coming into the city unlike any other city. Well, most cities and states are, are doing well, but we did, we're doing exceptionally well because of all the real estate's being transferred. They have had no great ba budget battles. It's a $6 billion budget, and they had the money. They got the money. And, you know, you take things like the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority. I think that's its correct name. My goodness. I mean, these people are a fiefdom. And most of them are appointed. They're appointed. And they're, they're bureaucrats. And they just go ahead and do what they want to do. If the program is green, if we're going to bulldoze along Gary Boulevard, we'll, we'll bulldoze Gary Boulevard. 
they can make their own money. They can write their own checks. They can just about mint it, you know? Uh, there's something on the ballot, uh, I think, in the November election, San Francisco, part of the reform community thing, that's going to give them the power to issue their own bonds, you know, without asking anybody, you know? <laughs> and also to raise parking fines. And the, all the money from the parking fines, however they raise it, goes to them to decide how to spend. It's like, wait a minute. And, but nobody is objecting to any of this because everybody's sort of sharing in the goods. And that keeps going. It keeps going. In all the departments. In all the departments. Someone has, a good friend of mine is doing a lot of research. If you were to take the number of nonprofit employees yep. and add them to the 26,000, we'd probably be up to 35 or, 30, or almost 40,000 people either directly or indirectly working for the city and county of San Francisco with 762,000 people. Well, not, now you've touched another sensitive area. You know, uh, what a lot of people in this town call the nonprofit mafia. Right? Mm -hmm. There are all these do-good organizations, and they are basically uh, responsible for holding down the building of housing in the city. Uh, a lot of them will buy uh, houses, get money from the city from the bond issue, and then they'll sit on that land, and they'll use that money for administrative purposes. And they are very active politically, very active. And district elections made them much more important because you got ground troops, like Supervisor Daly, an interesting cat because at least he shakes the can a bit. Uh, but you know he held up these guys who were developing the big recon towers for serious money, much more than they were willing to give. Now, where did a lot of that money go? It went to Charities, or let's call them just nonprofits, so designated or in the realm of supervisor daily. And what do the people who work for those nonprofits do? They go out and ring doorbells for supervisor right, okay. daily. Do they get, now, you tell me, uh, do they get ordered to do that or is it not in a wink to do that? Or do they organize within the campaign structure on certain days you're going to go here and you're going to go there? Or is it kind of, kind of that kind of quiet, subtle uh, recommendation to their workers at the nonprofit that they will support this candidate. Or to what would the difference be? Everybody knows you do that, or you're not going to have this job. <laughs> you know, they have long for this world. The nonprofits have uh, have have great power now, like the unions, don't they? Yeah. The unions had power then too, though, but yeah. less so in, in when there was a Republican and, and Democrat. Now, don't you think the unions are just they control a good a good amount of the agenda at the city hall? Well, the, uh, the, SEIU, the SEIU does yeah. because uh, the biggest employer is the, the city. It, it is the city. <laughs> that, that's all those people. And the trade unions, you know, remain strong but, but smaller. Yes. But uh, alongside what everybody used to say, the bogeyman of the unions. Well, unions, you can identify them and they do a lot of good sometimes. Yes. Uh, but the nonprofits, they're kind of invisible. <laughs> and they're not audited very often. No, no. And there's a lot of conflicts. I mean, the Catholic Church has been in conflict with issues where it's taking money. They're non that are They're non-profit. I mean, like the biggest bugaboo in this town is that nobody's ever raised the issue publicly, I mean, in a campaign thing, is if uh, you tax the Catholic Church's properties in this city, whoo-hoo, right? Well, it's not just San Francisco. It's yeah. all over the country. Well, they would also spend it, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. They would spend it. Well, there'd okay. just be more dough for the politicians. I wanna, we, we have a few minutes left. I want to go to another area, but it's related. And that is uh, something that some, Savannah Back Blackwell had said that, one of the, her, in her opinion, one of the reasons why we don't have uh, a good, healthy debate and, and, and different sets of candidates is because the media has changed so much. The Chronicle is no longer, is no, no longer important in, in, in creating debate, although in the last three months, their editorials and Nevius' work is doing what they used to do, which is shake it up and cause controversy. Un unlike that, or Ed Jew, nobody was complaining about anything. Now, what is your view of the Chronicle, the Examiner, and the newspapers in San Francisco right now and the impact of, of their problems? Well, I, I don't see where there's so much change. Like Savannah Blackwell, you mentioned, a very good writer and reporter, but she worked for years for the Bay Guardian. Mm -hmm. Has the Bay Guardian ever changed? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the PG&E is still the, every, the boogeyman. Everything goes to the PG&E. If it rains, it's the PG&E's fault. Maybe it is their fault. I don't know. But uh, it, you know, it's a one-solution paper. Uh, the, the, uh, what's happened, I think, in general to uh, newspapering in this town, it, it happened to the magazines a lot, too. That's why we started starting this new thing, more of a website called The Argonaut, because it's uh, uh, 
It's just getting so damn boring here. The personalities have gone so much out of politics. I mean, yeah. I saw it first. I, I worked for the Chronicle through a couple of tours of duty. And you began to notice it when you see the guys uh, and girls uh, waiting on the sidewalk for the commute bus to go home to Marin County instead of piling into the newspaper bar to drink with the printers and the truck drivers. <laughs> yeah? They get so separated from what's going on in town. And then a lot of their sources of information for what they get I see. only come from, as you, the usual stories we used to get at Ramparts, are disaffected city employees saying, you know, look at this cop the police department is going after now because he said what they're doing in Golden Gate Park is ridiculous. Yeah? They should be doing it when the crime's occurring, not when it's convenient for them to make, make plows to it. Yeah. See, but there's a similarity to that incident and the fact that the Edu incident, the, uh, no matter what the charges are, the fact is he was a rebel at that board. He was the only one in the last two to three years that was actually voting and speaking out in a way that was different than this huge mainstream that demands that everyone agree with their green carbon foot policy yeah. in the city. So why do you think everybody piled on Ed Judy? He was Dr. No. <laughs> you know? He was Dr. No. And they were out to get him. I mean, it's extraordinary of you know four branches of actions against one guy for what? Something that's almost impossible to prove, your residency. You know? Uh, what are they protecting? Why, why did the uh, district attorney, the city attorney, the mayor, the board, and now go, uh, Attorney General Brown possibly, what are they so afraid of with this guy? Well, Jerry Brown uh, waited a long time to get in, in on this thing because he had serious concerns uh, about the basic the structure of, of city government because the city attorney represents everybody, including himself, and he represents and the board, too. And he represents the board, too. There's inherent conflict of interest. And in no that. one's ever been removed yeah. for this, per, for this yeah. charge. And this poor guy, Ed Jew, I mean, he's like being hit from here and there and there for the same things by all these different bodies. Why? Why? He, because he was somebody who was desirable to be removed. Uh, who there was, was a failed FBI mm -hmm. investigation uh, into him. Uh, it was hit. He was hit with very quick charges. It was one of these. How many times, looking back at the past, has a CIA, FBI raided City Hall in San Francisco? Quite a few. Quite a few. <laughs> and what's come out of it? Exactly nothing. No, no real prosecutions. Nobody went to jail. They just love to get uh, San Francisco. These FBI guys. And Ed Jew is like a fallout of that. I think that case against him, that tapioca case. Just it is ridiculous. The, you know, the, uh, we only have 10 seconds. If you read the last part of that indictment, you know what the mail fraud is? It's that the planning department mailed out the notices of violation. That's the mail fraud. A city department. Yeah, I know. That's the mail fraud. Yeah. Warren, the fact that you've been here and you've been with us for 30 minutes, maybe this begins uh, our contribution of bringing alternative views and creative views. Uh, you've, we're glad you were on the program. Good. And, <laughs> and, the, and your friend, Melman. Yeah. And uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Visit our website at www.sfunscripted.com.